so Dal Moet, um, I hope I'm saying that right. That's how I've been saying it. Moet. Just okay. say Moet. Okay, Dal yeah. Moet. Um, two BAFTA nominations for Nocturnal Animals and Blade Runner 2049. Five Saturn nominations with a win for Prisoners. Um, also worked on The Departed, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, a couple of James Bond films, Nightcrawler, First Man, and Spider-Man Far From Home. And of course, you've also uh, done individual makeup for Mark Wahlberg, Daniel Craig, J.J. Allen Hall, and Ryan Gosling. Um, so I'm going to just kind of start at the beginning, I suppose. You've been in the industry, I mean, a long time now. Uh, I'm not going to date you, but um, <laughs> what kind of, you know, for someone that started out, you know, 30 years ago, what right. kind of inspired you to pursue a career and, and get into mm. the industry and what was your jumping on point? Well, well, well thanks for having me, by the way. And, of course. And nice really excited. To see you. Um, you know, I, I've started, you know, I really, I don't want to be, you know, cute and so I started when I was 12, but I actually started when I was really young. I, I was doing makeup and school plays and stuff when I was 14 or 15. Um, don't ask why. I couldn't act. Couldn't really, you know, I thought costumes were interesting. I thought you really had to draw really, really well to be a costume designer. But of course, I realized none of them really do. Mm -hmm. um, and they have people draw for them. I mean, had I known. Who knows? You know, I, there were so many things you don't know about this business when you start, because people don't really give you, you know, if you want to know how to be a doctor, or how to be a nurse or a teacher, there's really ways to find out. But to say, how do I do makeup in the movies is really kind of not your guidance counselor in your last year of high school is going to yeah. be clueless. Right. Um, and they'll just wonder what's wrong with you, you know, um, and why aren't you going to really do something else? Uh, so I started really, um, I don't like to say by accident because it was intentional. I started to work and, and people said, you know, you're kind of good at this and, and other people calling and I started reading everything and I did any job I could. And especially when they were willing to pay, I thought this is kind of great to get paid money. Even my mother kind of got into it. My parents were not exactly thrilled. Like their youngest son is going to be a makeup artist and kind of I'm the first to say it's, it doesn't sound good on paper. I'm sorry. <laughs> it does not sound good on paper. Um, and, you know, it's like saying, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, that's how we're raised, right? So, and I just ended up working in some theater and amateur theater and operatic stuff. And I did kind of get, do a couple of little student -y type films. And I really put my name out there. You know, went to England, tried to do that, hopeless. It was just, terrifying because I was, I don't know, 19 doing makeup demos in a department store. I really did everything you're supposed to do. And I still kept hitting brick walls. And then there was this real shift. And then I went back home. And finally, I mean, I put my name on all the union lists for available. And I finally got a call and it was on a, you know, terrible movie, um, which they always are. And I got thrown into it doing background. It was a meatballs movie. <laughs> You know, how about that? Yeah. Um, a meatballs movie with Patrick Dempsey. And I was, I don't know, 19, 20 years old. And one thing leads to another, as things do. And if you do a decent job, uh, we hope you'll get recommended. And um, that's really what kind of launched me. Wow. Um, I know, obviously, even if you're a veteran, you've been in the industry for 20, 30 years, you're always going to face new challenges or have learned, be learning new things. But right. earlier on, was there any like particular moment or a particular film where you kind of felt like, okay, I'm, I'm here. Like I finally kind of arrived mm -hmm. feel, like confident about this. Well, it certainly wasn't the meatballs. Movie. <laughs> right. Do you know what's really funny? I mean, I'm glad you're asking. It's a great question because uh, sometimes students when I'm, I'm going overseas or in different colleges and film schools, people will ask, I actually really do think it takes 10 years. I think it takes 10 years of anything mm -hmm. to say, I, I know what I'm doing. You know, like in 85, 86, when I started, I was a junior assistant on the fly and it was terrifying because I was vastly underqualified to be the assistant to Chris Whalas, Stefan Dupuis, Margaret Prentice, who were gonna win an Oscar for this makeup with genius. Right. And there I am like gluing the hands on Jeff Goldblum and the feet and my job was to clean the suit. And even that, I managed to screw up and sprayed it with vinegar instead of, and it, you, I mean, it was just <laughs> everything that could go wrong, but they liked me and they were very nice to me. I ruined the brushes. I spoke to Jeff too much. I interrupted him with Gina Davis. I mean, 
you know, everything you, but I was still was a hard worker. And I think that leads you to people going, you know, that guy, and I really believe in that. And I think by the time I was on my first couple of jobs as a key, well, we used to call that HOD. Now it's HOD and key, it's stupid, but anyway. Um, so now we've mixed it all up. But when I was first like the key makeup on a job, a big job, Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future was kind of a big deal at the time, it was television. Um, I remember being so unsure because people could throw me very easily. Like if, if you came up to me and, hey, Donald, what's wrong with that? Like, I would be like, what, what's wrong with it? I mean, and that's what you're like. And of course, I think you're like that till about the f seven, eight, nine. And then you get to a point, and I'm not sure what film it happened, but I remember when people start talking to you differently. Mm -hmm. And it takes a very long time. And it really, you have to suffer some real fools and some real asses, I got to tell you, till you kind of go, well, I know we can't use any language, but you know what I'm going to say. And it's, it's yeah. the same in your profession. I mean, oh, yeah, 100%. You, know, so you kind of go, what the f you know, what do you know? And I, it took me, and then I'll, I will say even this much, it took me another 10 years to actually go, God, you know, you really start to see who's not good because you're so busy trying to be good when you're new and young that you forget a lot of people around you were not good and never were. And... <laughs> I think then you get to that point and kind of go, oh my God. So that's for me, I would say I'm 30 something years in. I would say it took me, um, oh God, a long time. I'd say 15 years. And then I'd be on a movie where a director would say, God, I love that. Made Three Kings. Uh, mm. I remember people saying, I love that makeup on, on Mark. Or, and I, so I'd say, yeah. And then a few more years till I was able to turn jobs down or not like the idea of a job and say, you know what, it's not for me. And that took uh, 15 years, easy. Wow. Easy. Um, and, and with that kind of longevity that you've had, obviously so much about filmmaking has just changed, you know, from the fly to Blade Runner 2049, for example. Right. The introduction of things like digital filmmaking and, you know, a lot more heavy, you know, visual effects. How has that kind of in affected the work that you do, which is obviously a lot more practical ideally but well um you know it has because i remember when we switched the terror you know when so in a nutshell uh in film and television when you were starting in anything in film the connection was always you started in commercials because they were film mm -hmm. right they were 35 millimeter right. and you made which now i could never get in the commercial market i, I don't know why when i started so i went television but the connection was always theater to television but i had done theater so a television was always perceived to be a little bit heavier handed and in terms of makeup and a bit more everyone looks good all the time that kind of attitude yeah. it's a lot of stereotypes and a lot of um there's a real hierarchy too isn't there so i switched between both and i know when television we did all the mows which people who are old enough listening will remember them that was a big deal you had all-star movies of the week on Sunday night. They were filmed 16 millimeter though. So you got a lot of leeway in 16. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you got a lot of leeway. <laughs> um, and so some people didn't train up. I really wanted to be a feature film makeup, like 35 millimeter. So I was working on those films and learned to have a, a, a softer hand. When things started switching back and going digital, I remember being terrified because I listen to everybody talk. And it's the same thing. You listen to a lot of people go, oh my God. And then I worked, one of my first jobs digital was the girl with the dragon tattoo. And I remember being really apprehensive about it. And David Fincher is one of the most impressively knowledgeable people in the industry. And I remember sort of going to him, who I was a bit, you know, we were like, this is, you know, big time now. I've gone like into this movie. I just come off Cowboys and Aliens, which, you know, you kind of go, okay. <laughs> and, and then you're with David Fincher talking and he's telling me what he likes, doesn't like, colors, things like that, watch for red. Do you know what, the trend, for me, the transition to digital, no problem. I think because I learned the one thing, it's about the camera, mm -hmm. it's about the lighting, and it's about your cinematographer. And then I had the great good fortune of my career to work with Roger Deakins. And that changed 
my whole, and now when I go to work in film, I occasionally say, hey, guess what? We're shooting film. I kind of not so interested anymore. Right. Um, and so we've gone through a lot of technical changes where the makeup's much harder than it used to be. Um, people listening will know that because when, when I started, you could get away with a lot of stuff. Even the audience were like, oh, that's pretty cool. But now like your makeup effects, your prosthetics, everything has to be state of the art, the best. Well, that's pretty tall order to fill. The actors haven't had to change. I mean, they have to work more with the green screen. Mm -hmm. But we really more than, I'll get in so much trouble for saying this. <laughs> What we do is way harder than what a lot of other people have to do. Because, you know what I mean? Cinematography, camera, uh, all of that's changed. And so is what we've done. Hair hasn't changed. Costume hasn't. Maybe some color saturation. But actual costume design has not changed. Um, production design, again, same little. But ours really has changed and our numbers. So... I think that our crews haven't kept up the way other departments have. It's made a real imbalance. And I think it makes us crazy too, because we're, I think we feel a bit like uh, we got left behind a little bit in being still below the line. And uh, we fought really hard and we still do the longer hours. And, and we have the connection, the personal connection. Other people can actually get around. And, you know, with COVID is a true example of, Who's going to be good at this wearing a mask, talking to people? Um, we'll still be able to do it. But I mean, you know, the sound guy or one of the grips might struggle in this moment trying to do what we do. Um, so, yeah, so I've just gotten a lot of trouble saying that, but that's it. I, I love that because actually one of the questions I was going to ask was kind of, I feel like in the industry, makeup gets so overlooked, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or it's just the work is like not understood fully. Because even for me, who's been following the industry for years and has gotten more and more, I've studied film. I know a lot more about something like cinematography or VFX or even costumes than I do about like makeup and hair. And so I feel like a lot of times people just don't appreciate it as much or really understand. I think that kind of is a good job of addressing that kind of disconnect, I feel like maybe. Well, you know, it's really a good point because I mean, I like reading up on you and you're very impressive. I mean, you write well and you've done, you know, and I think that, you. you know, one could maybe even sort of say, well, there's similarities in terms of like what you do. A lot of people don't understand writing. Mm -hmm. It's a fair thing to say. So writers are misunderstood. Therefore they're misunderstood on set. Right. Um, which is why people don't always love it when they're on the set because right. the writers don't always understand what's happening. And to, to their credit, they want to, but they're not really filmmakers, right? right? They're writers. And I think with makeup, unfortunately, and more so with hair, because hair is like a whole world out there of hairdressers and an industry. It would be like if there was a cinematographer on every street corner, but there isn't. So hair kind of came into the industry under the auspices of makeup. And it's brilliant, but more times than not, it's just what it is. And I think with makeup, the same thing happened when people started seeing like amazing transformations. That's all they understood. But it's actually a lot more to it, as you know, and creating characters can be as what seems insignificant as a, you know, a, a gold tooth or a contact lens or that I would do. Um, people don't realize what goes into that. And that my job is to make sure you don't notice what I do. Right. It's kind of like a Ryan Gosling said that to me once on it was very it was quite flattering actually because he said like you're like a cut man and I realized he's right that's exactly what it is it's like boxing because I did it with with Wahlberg and genius on on the fighter um, I guess the example okay it's a, I think it's a fair example on the fighter I put so much emphasis in my prep with David O Russell on doing the makeup for Melissa Leo and. Christian Bale, making them look, you know, not good. And, and Christian like a crackhead and Melissa like she looked and, and Amy was, you know, the way she looks, they were kind of, it was like Amy and Mark are cute. And then those two look kind of busted and, and real characters. But what was so interesting is in the end, the most complicated makeup in the film was actually on Mark. It was the most nuanced and the most, and a bit daring because I had the nerve to put those bandages on his face, which I thought I'm going to get killed for this, but it kind of worked. Yeah. And you know, it was, 
for me, when it came time to looking back at the film, I sort of went, well, Melissa was kind of, once she was done, the hair was set and Johnny did a great job with that, with his team. Once she was set with like Cheryl and, and uh, Brenda and everybody, that was it. They just copied it. But Mark, we did all the fights. We did all that, f the sequence in the ring. And I was like a cut man because I was starting over. And, and Ryan said that to me on Blade Runner because I had so many steps in his makeup between eyes and makeup and blood and dirt and, that it really was right before we would roll and they'd say, come on, Donald, get in. And then I would go. And it was like, like that. So I think if people look at it that way, they might have a better understanding of the process, especially for the actor as well. Yeah, that's really insightful. I think, um, and you talking about working with, with Mark and with Ryan specifically, that, that was, when I've always looked at your credits, I always wonder kind of, how do you become a, like a single actor's like consistent makeup artist? And as opposed to not being like the head of the department on a project? Well, for me, it was a choice because I started in the industry as the HOD. Well, not from the beginning, but I was more getting established as an HOD when I started working more with Wahlberg. And that was by accident because we got on very well. We did a couple of jobs, the big hit and the corruptor, I think. The corruptor I was actually on because they'd hired me to do um, the amazing Chow Yun Fat. Uh, and then Mark said, hey, guess what? I'm going to be on this movie. I'm, I'm already on it. So it was one of those. And then he'd asked me to do The Yard. So I was HOD on that. But then came Three Kings. And I think because it was so specific, there's no way you could be in this trailer to get here, to go there. So I started working with him exclusively. And we did that for quite a while. Um, it's not my favorite thing. I, don't, I like being a person like with Daniel. Right. I like it on certain films, it makes sense. Other films, it's quite boring. And um, that's the truth of it. Other films, you're like, ah. But, um, you know, it's a high-class problem. Yeah, there you go. You know, it's a very high-class problem. But, you know, your work is, my work is important to me. And so if I'm going to sit all day, um, I'd like to be, you know, busy. And, and I think with Mark, the types of films he started doing after that weren't really that makeup intensive, yeah. you know, so that changed for me a little bit, but I now switch between the two. Yeah. Um, and I have to put you on the hot seat just with this question out of those four guys that we've kind of been talking about, who's your favorite? <gasps> <laughs> Do you know, I love them all and they're all very different. Oh yeah. I can imagine. Uh, they're all very different. I have unique relationships with each one as they do with me. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really have a favorite, but I think, <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, a parent, um, in yeah. a way, sort of like a brotherly, I don't know what it is, fatherly, motherly, there's some kind of a symbiotic relationship you build. And I think it's based because it's like an older man, younger man kind of thing. So certainly I felt that with Mark and, and Jake and Ryan to some extent, Daniel and I are a bit more same generation, very similar upbringings. Daniel and I, extremely similar. Um, culturally, my parents are from the UK. He is, you know, he's from the north of England. My mother's from Scotland. I mean, it's, my dad was a teacher. His father, his mom's a teacher. It's kind of very, we have very similar upbringings and I think very similar uh, reactions to things. Wow. So on a, a certain level, but Jake knows me well. Actually, Wahlberg probably knows me better than most people. Wow. He knows how I'll react to things, even though I don't really work with him now. Um, and Jake and I probably have um, a relationship that I think is the most, that I think is an actor and a makeup man or a makeup artist, the most symbiotic, uh, the most kind of uh, where it makes sense uh, to develop his character. So I would say on, on a certain level, Jake and I, Ryan, I mean, very good, but it's, it's just different. Jake and I have just learned to, I think, uh, develop characters together. Mm. Certainly on Nightcrawler and Prisoners. For sure, yeah. 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 Um, which is funny you mentioned Prisoners just now because that was just what I was about to get into. Um, but talking about just a little bit on the makeup for Prisoners for Jake specifically, I wanted to ask because I always, yeah. always hear these fun facts and different bits of trivia. The finger tattoos. Uh-huh. Was that Jake's idea? How did you two develop that or where did that come from? Because people love those yeah. little details. 
it's you know it's funny because i i mean at first at first i hated the whole idea i was so conflicted because i come from a place where sometimes i think you can overdo it with makeup and i'll get in trouble for this i think some people try too hard and you're like okay enough it's like what did the chanel say take one thing off you can't have i really believe this you can't have makeup hair and costume elements all working at one time you have one or the other so if your leading girl is in something you can't be doing this makeup and hair do the hair or do the makeup um and i think with jake when i first worked with him um and i'd never worked with denise villeneuve before it was all new to me and i came in a bit last minute um and they kind of fought to get me because it was shot in atlanta they wanted to use a local i owe that to roger and james deacons really because they kind of said hey you know get donald because we worked with him on skyfall and you know that's how the business works and they're friends of mine and i love them and i think you know i think when you get recommendations like that and then jake came in and we talked a little bit on the phone uh, uh, about a month before and i thought oh this is going to be something because he really wants to explore the character is on paper sometimes sometimes on paper a, a role doesn't read as great as it turns out i think that's the case with that whole movie i would 100% agree and i always talk about this with prisoners because i love that movie oh my god I think, i think everyone in that film operates and elevates the script and the characters to a level that they would not be you know, oh yeah i mean when you first read it you kind of wow okay that's <laughs> how i was so i think what i started to recognize was that i really learned a lot from deni from roger cuz they have exquisite taste deni has an eye so i know i can't pull a fast one <laughs> not that i would but he really will stop and we've had a couple of moments where he'll say what do you think and so with jake was a moment we figured out the hair uh i had to bring somebody in we had it was hard and then just getting like something about institutional but some kind of a russian vibe uh, there was always something in my head that the character had a russian vibe to him and i thought with that hair and then jake wanted these tattoos and i thought you know this is really difficult cuz we're doing too many things we're doing the this and the neck and the wolf and the fingers but you know i will say that I, he had to push me a little bit and i push back there are a couple I'm like okay I think we're going too far with this and everybody let us do our thing and then Denise saw it and was like yeah okay I like it now I've almost never done a, a hand tattoos again because I've seen it too many times in movies I've just seen it one too many it's like doing the gold tooth I yeah. think we've covered that for a moment and i've just been through it with jared leto on the little things so sometimes your little i kind of go oh sh i'm running out of like i'm running out of ideas and then the actor will always come up with something S frankly i'll do anything if you want me to put i mean a polka dot in the middle of your face i'll do it if it gives us a way to try something but in the end and certainly with denise films we always come back to base in reality and i think with jake we got the right i think the neck worked i think the hands worked with the hair and the thing and we were good you know it was it was good um talking about deni and that was the first project you guys worked on together you know what was it kind of like first meeting him and did you get a sense right away when you guys started working that that was going to be a, like a strong working relationship going forward and that you'd still be working with him 6 7 years later you know you never count on anything do you i mean the business is so fickle and he certainly not i mean he's just remarkable but i felt like you know the thing for us often you've got lots of things at work you've got actors will request people producers will request sometimes a costume designer i mean uh yeah, the first ad i mean we're a job that some quite frankly you kind of go what what's happening here i think you know the the um i never thought i'd work with deni again until sicario came along and i was almost on another job and Roger was going to be on it and James and his whole team and I didn't want to miss it of course not and I'm so glad I didn't I nearly did terminator. Oh. I mean, you know, no discredit to them, but I think we can all say you sometimes made the right choice like and I I'm happy for them and gave other people a great job. So, but for me it was not the right fit. And uh they made an incredible thing of their type of movie, but I'm I'm more in that world and 
Yeah. You know, Denise has been really, really good to me. Um, you work hard and you're challenged. You don't walk in and just you get away with it. You have to really defend your position and come up with stuff. And it's often very last minute. And, and I think because I can work that way with him, um, other people might find it difficult. Some people are too rigid for it. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we did prisoners and I think it went really well. And uh, I was happy with the, uh, and I loved the, pro I loved the project. I loved working on it. The people, I, the cast, I just, everybody, the producers, everybody, everything about that film, I still have a good feeling about. And I have the same thing with Sicario. So that is very telling because I usually start to hate everybody. So, <laughs> um, just when I get mad or I'm tired, but I didn't feel that way on Prisoners. No, that's really, um, especially you can get the comment about Sicario versus a Terminator movie. And you're saying you're kind of like more of the world of like Sicario, or maybe Prisoners, which is more grounded and more, more real. Um, which is interesting because obviously you eventually did do, you did Blade Runner 2049. And that was kind of based on what I've seen. It was kind of your first time really diving into a full like science fiction, completely different type of universe. So like for you coming from something that's more maybe naturalistic, mm -hmm. how was that for you? Was that daunting? And how did you kind of go about creating a look for that universe? It was terrifying. It was terrifying. But the truth is, you know, I mean, before it came up, I talked to another, and I always use Blade Runner as um, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner as the Blade Runner has always been uh, for many of us in, in design, costume, makeup, whatever, has always been an example that I use. I use Sid and Nancy. I use 1984, uh, Children of Men. I mean, all kinds of films for reference. And Blade Runner has always been, but going back to like television, Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. I mean, it sounds ridiculous now, but it wasn't in 1987. That was interactive. You had a toy like with the television. It was a big deal. And I think I looked at Blade Runner. So I was, I felt like, look at me, I'm using Blade Runner as an example for a television series called Captain Power. You know, um, and I think when they approached me for Blade Runner and our, producer Bill Carraro called me I was a little bit like oh my god and I thought I why me like it's not it's so and I'm sure people said it and I know my my people I'm sure people want why him um and that's what the business I mean there's haters right yeah. there's haters and everybody wants what someone else has and but I realized when I was getting I was in Boston finishing stronger with Jake and which is a film I loved working on and I was so disappointed for kind of how it was received, but I loved working on that job. And I was kind of, what am I doing on this movie with, you know, Jake and, and creating this look and then going to Blade Runner. But after I talked to Denis, I think I called him at home and I said, can I talk to you for a minute? And, you know, we don't know each other that well at this point. And I sort of said like, I don't know, this job, like, and I started looking at his references. And, and I think when he sort of said, look, of course you're terrified, everybody is, mm -hmm. everyone is. And Roger kind of said the same thing. And I went over there for dinner one night and I talked to Roger and James. And, you know, then I kind of went, you know, we're all in this together. We really are. And we'll figure it out. So that's kind of how I ended up. And, and maybe that's why Blade Runner, for me, why it worked is because the stuff I did is based in reality. Mm -hmm. And maybe that lens, you know, we borrow and try different things. Maybe that's why it, it worked. Um, for me, I mean, I felt very satisfied that I didn't do some, you know, I loved you know, Jared Leto. I thought we did things that would be, for me, a little bit on the sci-fi spectrum of things, but not, right. not, you know, not into the other world of sci-fi. Yeah, and it's funny to talk about, like, we're all in this together. And I think, even though that film didn't get, I think, enough of its due that it was deserved, I think everyone that came into that project somehow developed the perfect storm that could make mm -hmm. a Blade Runner sequel that was equal to, or even, you know, superior possibly to the original, which like I said, I've seen that movie 13 times now and I, I saw it six times in theater. So I did my part to help the box office out. But, um, wow. Good for Well, I love hearing that because I know that they had done this thing in England and the UK called secret cinema. I don't know if you know about them. 
but I heard about it and was kind of fascinating. It's not my world. It's too kind of, but they do a whole, they did a whole secret cinema on Blade Runner 2049 in London. And it was really like people made costumes. They did makeup. I saw this guy made a little doll of Ryan Gosling with all the blood that I had done. I, I thought, look, we went out on, we really, you know, and I wasn't feeling a hundred percent. And the movie was hard. I mean, I'm not going to lie. And there was, you know, I had a tough department and I, I made a couple of choices. Maybe I don't know if I would do that again. Um, but I think we made an extraordinary film. Every time I went to the set, no matter what Roger had done or what Denis was planning, I, you know, and we had a couple of days that were like, eh, with lots of different people. But for the most part, it was uncomfortable and hot and sweaty and humid. But you know what? It was extraordinary pleasure to go on that set um, every day and kind of work in that environment. Um, I'm talking about 2049, I'm gonna try to hit on a couple of main like makeup related to characters in that film. I know Dave Batista as Sapper, originally from what Denny and, and Dave have both said, they thought he was too, too young. Right. Mm -hmm. and, Apparently they brought him back and tried some makeup tests to see if they could age him. Were you involved with those? Yeah, yeah. So I organized that. So what happened, it was really strange. So um, he was in Atlanta, Dave, Dave was sh shooting Guardians. And they had a studio and Denis had asked me if I would age him. I just couldn't get to Atlanta. So I called John Blake, a good friend, who was the HOD on that, mm -hmm. on Guardians. Is that what it's called? Guardians. Guardians. I said, would you do a huge yeah. favor? So that's how we, I had a very specific, what I wanted them to do, a simple aging and they, they followed it. And I was very, you know, that's what we have to do for each other. Um, and so we really, we were live. We did this whole thing with those two guys who look after Dave, uh, John Moore and, um, oh God, don't let me forget his name, please. Uh, Pritch, uh, it'll come to me. Um, <laughs> But anyway, John Blake is the one I went to. And so we did this online and we got Dave in and we did a whole thing, glasses and bring it up, bring it down. And then we tested him again when he came to. But basically the studio hired him and then he hired him based on, you know, my putting together a makeup test that we could age him. And was that pretty much the same look and same method that you used once you guys were actually on set and like filming or did that change at all? I think it changed because what they had done, I think was too... I mean, I liked it because it was very subtle, but I think for what we had to do in our lighting, I think we had to augment it a little bit, make it a bit heavier. Right. And I think also, I mean, I think the, the, because Denis would see it, I think once he saw what we had done in the test and he saw Dave in person, he was a little bit like, well, maybe you can do, and that's how it goes, right? Right. And so I remember that we augmented Dave a little bit and I think it works in the film. I think it works really well. Um, but we certainly took it up, I'm going to say 15% from what we did in the test. But also, you know, we had the costume and then uh, that light, because it was particularly low light in that room. We only see him those, you know, right. he only worked four days or whatever that was. Um, I'm very happy we didn't do a prosthetic makeup because at one point somebody said to me, don't maybe, and I'm like, okay, but here's the thing. It's Blade Runner. We're shooting in Hungary. Where are we doing this makeup? Where are we making it? Who's available? And how much time are we going to have? And that makeup took an hour to do. Okay, yeah, that's that sounds like yeah. a there. Now, the very difficult thing was when he's on the ground fighting with with Kay, played by Ryan Gosling, is and he's like hammering at his face and his eyes and pulling that face apart. So we were screwed either way. We were going to have a problem, whether it was a prosthetic makeup or a straight makeup. And I think it was a good call on my part, but I feel, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to anticipate and we don't always. And I don't think we would have had the time anyway with Dave coming in as last minute as he did. Yeah. No, I definitely, I mean, again, as someone who's seen it so much and I've even talked to people that when we've watched it and they don't even recognize or realize it's Dave Batista. So okay, well that's great. Say, yeah, the, the, the job was done. Um, and of course, the other, the other main character that I want to talk about from 24-9 and is probably the most famous or iconic scene or image from that movie is, is Pink Joy, obviously. And right. I, I was curious, obviously, again, as someone who maybe doesn't know enough about makeup and I think audiences just don't realize what is makeup and what isn't. When I first saw it, I 
thought that it was, they obviously recreate her as a CGI hologram, but mm -hmm. I thought they changed all the color and everything in post and that they, she was just normal when you guys recorded. Could you tell me obviously how you went about transforming her for that shot and kind of finding the right color and how Roger influenced right. Well, it's interesting because everyone thinks that and that's where you kind of go, you see, everyone has now got to the world of CG and the visual effects of Blade Runner, as remarkable as they were, was also a bit of a handful for us because that department works way more people than us. Um, it's, you know, they were always looking for scans. I mean, we really struggled on that film because I had a very limited crew and there was always something we had to do for VFX. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a whole other thing that goes on. But certainly with Joy, I knew there was a sketch, there was, um, uh, Denis had sent me something very early on before we even left of a couple of versions. The first one I saw, I didn't love. It looked a bit too much like Mystique. Mm -hmm. I felt, and she was red, and there was something about it. And then he, we talked about contact lenses. So we did some Photoshop, but I also went back and forth with Denis, and she went from being kind of red to sort of pink. But I pulled all, whenever he sends me an image, I found... I find myself getting counter images or counter, pardon me, so I can go back and say, you mean, what about this? And that's when you'll get his interest and go, that's it. And I did find um, a book where there was a, a kind of, not a Barbie, but there was something that uh, stood out to me on the color. Now, of course, I didn't know who the actress was until they told me, Anna de Armas. At that time, nobody knew her. Right. You know, now she's a huge star and I'm thrilled for her. Mm -hmm. But at the time was like, is her skin very pale? Like if we make her pink. And so I really brought all body makeup with me. I went to my beauty supplier in North Hollywood before I left, because I was starting to get very nervous. We tried uh, green screen contact lenses. So that could be any color. So we did them in green and yellow. Then I did purpley black and, oh my God, I think we made six contact lenses for her. Took her for a lens fitting picked up everything in pink, but every time, and then it was going to be pink hair, but somehow the pink hair wasn't working. Um, and it was just going to be one of those, you know, cheap kind of Hollywood wigs, right? And that Carrie would just put on her, but the pink wasn't, it had to be more of a contrast, like a mauve or purple. When we got to Hungary, we, I pulled all this stuff out and I would go up to Roger's office and say, what is pink to you? Because I learned that as well. Tell, ask somebody what pink is. It's a bit, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and so I started saying, is it like bubble gum? Is it that color? Is it this color? Is it this color? And I would finally go up and say, look, this is what I think it is. And that's when Roger said, that's it. But of course on her skin would look a bit different because she's slightly more yellow skin, Cuban background. Anyway, that's what we did. It was not a high tech makeup at all. We did it by hand with my wonderful key, Joe McNeil. And we did the first time right in Anna's trailer, like, you know, just three of us, we just did it. And then uh, we tweaked it. I suggested a pink lipstick, la, la, la. We changed that wig, uh, Carrie put, we went to the mauve one. We did one with lenses, one without. Everybody loved it. And, and it was, I think we did it twice. But it was a big focus in the film and a lot of stress, uh, but actually much easier than people think. The irony in all of this is everyone thinks it was done strictly computer or CG. But it was really a practical makeup. That's amazing that because, especially talking about the color pink, what is pink? When I like, when I, every time I see that image, it's like the most bright, perfect pink, like shade of pink. Like it's like, when I think about pink, like that's pink. And right. So I think it's interesting. And with the contact lenses, did you guys end up using like black ones for the? Yes, black? I was surprised. So the very dark ones, I don't know why he liked them. For me, they looked like raisins. I don't know. There was something about them. Um, and, but she was comfortable in them. They weren't going to be in very long. We right. had done a couple of variations. It all goes a little bit, a little bit X Men. Um, and at first, and that's what she ended up having were those dark ones, right? And at first I wasn't sure. And Denise shot, we did two. One with her eyes, which made her just too human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we did the other one with those bizarre eyes, which worked really well. And, um, you know, we cut a lot of other things like the manga where she's got lenses there with that crazy uh, hair. Yeah. It didn't really get enough of that, I thought. Um, 
But yeah, she was fantastic. She was great. And uh, last thing on on Pink Joy, you have you seen the full film? Yeah. When you first, obviously, you're you're there for months and weeks preparing, and you you go through it all and you create it. When you first see it, you know, on the big screen like that, what you know, what was kind of your first impression, and and how did you feel knowing that it had kind of come together? You know, it was kind of amazing. It was a very, uh, it was personally a very tough time when the movie came out. I, I think we had the premiere over at the Dolby mm-hmm. over here. It was a lot to take in, it, to be honest. And I'm terrible at looking at things I worked on, and, as everybody is, and, and we all feel that. It's very hard, um, but then you kind of warm up to it and you start looking at it enough and to go back looking at clips. It was kind of overwhelming, to be honest with you. Um, for me because a lot went into it and it was a whole personal thing and what's happened in your life and the movie, you know, uh, a lot of things happen. So it's very hard to separate the two at that point because everything does become one and uh, the things you don't agree with or I should have done this or should have done that. Um, I don't have many regrets about the film. So in terms of my side of it, uh, I thought it all turned out and, you know, I, but it was terrifying. It's, and that you pay a price for. I, my health certainly suffered. Certainly that project, my health suffered. Um, well, okay. I'm going to, I know we've, we've kind of like talked to hit on a little bit about you, the fact that you're working on Dune, obviously. And I know that's pretty hush hush. Can't say too much, but yeah, I, I have to ask, otherwise I wouldn't be doing my job. Some questions. Um, okay. Mainly, well, mostly just regarding how you approached. I mean, what I noticed looking at the what it, at least it's credited as right now is this is, is it's the first time that you're head of makeup, head of hair, prosthetics designer, and makeup hair designer. Was that true? And if so, like, was that like kind of a lot and like all at once or kind of worked out? Yeah, when Dune came up, there were a number of obstacles because I kind of went, wait a second. If I've got to take, you know what it is really, to be honest, John, is when you, when you take something on where well, you're going to answer for a lot of that stuff anyway, right? You kind of go, well, if I'm going to be doing it anyway, like Blade Runner, where I kind of was in charge, but hired hair people and things like that, or suggest people, um, if you're going to be taking that responsibility anyway, you may as well be really recognized as the person. Mm-hmm. And I felt that stepping up, particularly because working in the UK, that's what they do. I felt like, you know, I've done 30, many years where I was doing that, like running the prosthetics or designing a character. But I get great people. I mean, both Blade Runner and certainly Dune. I mean, Dune, I have some phenomenal people working. I mean, you know, great people, makeup, hair, prosthetics. It's kind of staggering but they also let me the production and the studio let me decide all of that top to bottom hair prosthetics everybody which is kind of what it should be if you ask me on more films that's why you probably hear it from other people where there's all kinds of trouble in the hair makeup or in the prosthetics there's all kind because they've got too many people running it and i think certainly for me it worked very well and we have some very good people um on the project and I think the work shows and I want to hire people who are as good as me, if not usually better Mm -hmm. because that's my job. Right. So, uh, but I've done like makeup, hair supervision or prosthetics, makeup effects, you know, which, uh, but that's what the people I really like do. And the ones that I kind of feel like the film has a cohesive kind of look. And so that's what I did on Dune. And I hope I did a, a good job. Right, and, and kind of, you know, obviously this is, I think, your fourth collaboration with Denis. Um, what is that now like, you know, making Dune, you know, now that you have, a, you know, a stronger rapport and kind of relationship, is there, you know, more freedom or trust? And what was the kind of the feeling coming into that again with, with Denis for the fourth time? I think with Dune, I was, um, I think I'd made, uh, well, it was very difficult for me because I left the bond franchise to do Dune. Mm, so yeah. I made a huge, 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 huge change. It was very hard for me. Um, what what so precipitated to... that or what was the de- deciding factor, I guess? Well, it was really difficult because I love working with Daniel Craig. I mean, you know, what, what, you know, and the thing in a lot of these interviews and not this, because you're very good at this, is often it's a bit star driven and celebrity driven, but I really, I truly mean it. 
Daniel Craig is, I, I just can't, he is about one of like the finest tuned human beings I know. Um, in a very special way, there's something, and we have a very nice way of working. And it was really kind of, you know, on one hand you go, James Bond and Doom. And my creative inner filmmaker, makeup guy, Doom, there's no question. But the other part of me is like, Bond, come on. You know, there's, but it's like the safe choice and the right. dangerous yeah. choice is one of those. Maybe I'm a bad boy, really. I think I am actually. So I've never played it safe my whole life. I used to turn down TV because I thought, you don't, if you're going to do movies, you can't do TV. And it's still the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And I feel because I've done the two bonds and I love Daniel and Barbara and everybody were so good to me. It was a hard choice. What happened in a nutshell, it's not a lie. I was uh, in London and doing Spider-Man. And every time I opened up a newspaper, Bond is delayed. Bond is delayed. Bond. And then Dune gets announced. Yeah. Dune. And you're like, oh, my God. And then everybody's calling me. And then suddenly I get a phone call. Are you available? And I went, well, maybe I am available. Yeah. Because every time I read The Guardian, I mean, I'm not even getting told anymore like there's a new... I was told as a new director, but basically I was put on hold and basically told, well, you're not coming to Bond for five months. And I sat there going, well, I can be doing Doom. Like, this is no, I got to do this. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't have that many more years left. I'm in my fifties now. This is, so that's what I did. It was very difficult, a very tough choice um, for me. Very difficult. Um, it's rare you make friends. I really mean that. It's rare you make friends in this business, real friends. Well, in any business. Who are we kidding, right? right. In any business. To make a friend, but I really, really felt like I'm going to disappoint a friend. And I have to say, Daniel, everybody there were fantastic. And, you know, it was a little upset for me. I was really upset about it. But once I got to Dune and I was there, like exhausted, like trudging away in Jordan, I went, am I insane? I could be in Capri sipping, you know, yeah. cocktail, um, doing a nice makeup on Daniel Craig. But no, this movie for Denis, it's a challenge. It's, it's, what, it's what I'm about. And, you know, talking about Denis and Dune, like he has said many times that, you know, he read the novel as a teenager and just all these years he's been, you know, thinking if I could do something and make something, it would be Dune. Um, and so when he, when you have someone that's uh, such a fan of the novel and probably has all these images spinning around in them for so long, when he kind of, you know, comes to you and says, you know, I've been thinking about this or, you know, I had this in mind and you've already said, you know, he'll come to you with something and then you'll be like, well, what about this? Wait, was that a, kind of a challenge given his attachment or like knowledge of this property and then kind of having something in mind and you kind of needing to be like, Oh, well, what about these different options? No, not really. Um, not really because we didn't go back to that too much. So, um, no, I felt like, I mean, there were things I had in mind that came up that we talked about early on and, you know, no, I, I felt like there was real freedom in, in some respect. There are things you're, I mean, it's like Blade Runner, right? There's certain things, but we try everything. And I present him like my first ideas, what he's thinking. I get all the visuals from production design costume. Everybody's got to bring something. And then you end up kind of taking elements. That's really what I love about working with him. Because it's, you know, just because you do a board that's got somebody with all kinds of tattoos and all kinds of things happening, doesn't mean you're going to use it all. You might take one element. And that's what I love about him is that we choose and he'll say, no, maybe it's that. And we'll try it. And on the day, he might say to me, you know what, Don, that doesn't work. And it might be a little tattoo or a little something. And other times it works. So you know, Blade Runner, we were going to do, Jared at one point was going to be bald. I'm not kidding. Wow. Oh, no, it's there. It's a test somewhere. We did a bald. Bald with the beard. <laughs> it looked too much like another movie. Um, it was too soon. And then there was something about the long hair and sort of Svengali or yeah. Jesus -y. And then so we talked about the lenses and just did that, which, of course, was more than enough. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, uh, uh, so that's it. Um, 
and and again kind of talking about how you went from more like grounded you know non-sci-fi non-genre films then you have to do 2049 blade runner sequel and then right an ad- adaptation of dune what what about you know kind of in this project you think about just trying to like kind of ground yourself in or in in Denis's words when he tries to find you know the groundedness of it even though it's spectacular and there's all these amazing things happening how do you find that in a project that's this big and this kind of fantastical it's a great question i don't know i think um i don't know i i think you know, in the grand scheme of things, everything can be quite fantastic, right? And it's like the sky, the sea, whatever, the mountains. Mm-hmm. I think also how tiny we are in the big scheme of things, sometimes I look at. And, um, you know, maybe for, I, I need to go work on something that's not in the world of like creating a character that needs prosthetics or contact lenses. Right. You know, because then you go back to that and it's kind of, I'm reading a book right now of, I'm fascinated right now with Bob Dylan. I'm just obsessed with the girl from the North Country. I would love if that were a film. Is you know I'm obsessed because there's something about it. It's just having nothing, like no makeup, no hair, no, which essentially put me and a bunch of people out of work. But I'm not opposed to watching something like that. That's really. Right. Um, so I don't really know how to answer that because I think it's it's in the big picture, it's kind of overwhelming. When you're there, it's overwhelming and you kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on for it. And that we're all a bit kind of uh, nervous and how we've done something, but we'll see. And, you know, I just hope, but Blade Runner felt the same way. I mean, I was terrified when we would shoot certain things and like Ryan with all that blood on his face and where does it come from? And, and then it's like, let it go. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um. And just talking about how kind of, you know, you're in Hungary and you're in a sound sound stage and you're, you know, at the studio, obviously on Dune, you're out in the desert and it's hundred degrees and mm-hmm. what kind of, in being in Wadi Rum or, or in uh, Abu Dhabi, what kind of challenges does that environment, because uh, Denis and the cast have already talked about how hot it was and how it could be uncomfortable in the wind and all these different things. What for you approaching that and being in that environment was... <laughs> Well, do you know what's really hard is that, again, we come back to like the practicality, the dust everywhere, the soot. It's very much like when you're shooting a Western Mm. and you go to New Mexico, every, and all the people out there who do what I do, makeup, everybody, your stuff, like a Ziploc bag is covered in dust at the end of the day. Everything is covered in dust and sand. That's what it was like in Jordan. Mm. Um, You're you know, you got to be fit and you, you know, you're walking everywhere. You go on the dune buggies and those van, you're, you know, it's rocky and uh, you got to climb and it's tough. And, you know, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a young man's game. That's for sure. Cause I thought, boy, I can barely get up there. Um, you know, it's, it's hard uh, in the terrain. I used to do a lot of things like that. So I'm used to it, but I started to see even with my crew going, wow, we're all getting a little bit old for this. Like if you fall, you're in big trouble. So I started to recognize that was a huge thing. Um, the heat later was a huge thing. You know, like I would be like, oh, um, that's where you got to be young. You got to be fit. And if you're not young, you've got to be fit. And that's where a lot of people, including myself, did not, you know, this business does not help you. Mm-hmm. And that's the really, that was a very definitive side for me that I realized how dangerous the business is and how bad it is for our bodies. And you suddenly are out there going, wow, I'm doing it though. Like I was really proud of myself in Jordan because I'm like, wow, I did this. Like I cannot believe I've been up and down that and went here. And there were a couple of times I fell and really hurt myself and went, you know, who else is, who's doing this in their 50s? I mean, and we have people in their 60s and 70s still working. I'm like, but the idea, like my father's generation, you'd be in there in your mid fifties at four o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. walking up, you're like, this is pretty cool that I can do this and I'm alive and I'm kind of doing it. Um, so there, yeah, we had a couple of remarkable moments. I mean, there's sunset or sunrise in some of those places that I felt very privileged mm-hmm. for a lot of things in my life, but to work on a film of this scope with some of these people and that I'm able to be part of it and enjoy it and have, you know, made it to that level. And then there's another side where you go, yeah, but it's really tough and you got to be careful and, and moving forward, like how many can you do? And the heat factor is rough. 
the heat is rough. Uh huh. Um, you know, once again, I, I, I mean, this has been a wonderful experience for me. I really appreciate you taking the time and, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And it's funny cause I think it was around the time 24 nine came out and I was tweeting about it or posting about it. And we follow each other on Twitter and Instagram. So for, and, and the more I've gotten into writing and, you know, being the writer for this website, I've been thinking, you know, I really should just maybe just try to reach out and see what, you know, Donald. I'm so glad you did. Uh, well, thank you for, for uh, commenting on uh, the other day when I posted about Blade Runner. So um, I, I have had a wonderful time. I really appreciate it. I hope and think that maybe this won't be the last time we chat. So uh, I know. hope not either. Stay in touch. You know how to find me. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, um, there's a few other things. We'll see what's coming out. You know, uh, little things we finished at Thanksgiving. I'm, I think that'll be very interesting. The yeah. very fun makeup on Jared Leto. Um, so I think it'll be, you know, yeah, That'll be a good one too. definitely excited and, you know, stay safe. Good luck with uh, going over to Budapest next month. I hope that yes, goes. Yes, we're going to do this. It's going to be, you know, this is the hardest thing to do, I think, for us, but we'll, we'll get it done. But thank you for being so nice and, and um, let me know if you need anything. And...